Um, so it's kind of fun for me as a child psychiatrist to get to actually title a, uh, a talk normal um, because that's not usually in my purview all that often. Um, so, so thank you, Barbara and, and Ray, for, for letting me talk about normal stuff. Um, because the reality is most of what I see as a child psychiatrist has, has raised a red flag about maybe it's not normal. But I think that this is a, 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 an area that as primary care folks, this is your bread and butter. And I don't think that I'm going to say anything that you don't already know and probably know better than I know. But, but sometimes I think it can be helpful to just talk together and, and remind ourselves of kind of where we are and how we're thinking about it and, and, um, and learn from each other. So feel free to interrupt or bring up a specific situation. Hopefully at the end we can talk a little bit about when to worry, when to maybe think about calling your local child psychiatrist in your pocket um, and, and how to maybe frame a question or, or two that you might have. Um, so this is just the overview. We'll just talk about some general issues, some situations that in kids can lead to grief, because I think it's a little bit different than how we think about it in adults. The role that parents play in, in all of this, which like in everything else in children is essential. Um, what it looks like across the different the developmental spectrum. Um, what, how it can get more complicated. And then some other general considerations and, and when to worry. Okay. Um, so just some general thoughts, and again, these are all things that we know, but loss is inevitable, um, and I think it's an unusual person that lives to be, you know, an adult, get, get into their, their 20s and 30s, and hasn't had any kind of loss of some sort. Um, so loss is normal, but grief is normal, and it is not a pathological response, and I think you know, I really want to be mindful of not pathologizing things that are normal. Um, and sometimes that's, we do that as clinicians, sometimes families do that. Um, and I think sometimes that comes from parents' desire to protect children from any unpleasant emotion. Um, and I'll just do a little sidebar here. I don't know if, have people on the call seen the movie Inside Out? I, I think it should be mandatory reading for all grown-ups. I mean, mandatory viewing for all grown-ups, whether you're working with kids or not working with kids, because I think it is incredibly powerful to think about how parenting um, is impacted by, by the, the, the um, content of that movie. I mean, it, really it's about parents not wanting their kids to have any negative emotions. And the reality is negative emotions are normal. And sometimes that's hard for our parents to, to tolerate. The reality is, and I'm speaking and wearing my parent hat at the moment, if I could have kept my children wrapped in bubble wrap in the house all the time with me, I probably would have. Luckily, that's not allowed. So we, we do really want to protect our kids. Um, I would say, too, as a general statement, that all experiences in life are relationally driven and defined. So we experience things that happen to us in the context of how we are relating to the important people in our world. Um, there is no one way to grieve. Different cultures, different religions have different rituals for important reasons. But even within a, a single religion or, or um, cultural tradition, there are, there, people handle it in different ways, and that's important. And children handle it in different ways from each other, but also from adults. And so development matters. And, and it, Parents don't automatically understand normal development, and that's part of the thing that we need to be ready to explain. The other thing is just a general part of life is that whoever we are and whatever it is we have and whatever it is we do with our behavior all gets worse when we're stressed. So it's not usually the time when we are our best selves, and that's important for us to think about because we're asking parents to try to be their best self for their kids at a time when they're really struggling themselves. And so there can be a lot of um, confluence of challenges that make, make negotiating and navigating a grief reduction more challenging. Next slide. Okay, so I think, you know, nothing here should be too surprising, but I, but I think there are some situations in kids that, that we sometimes can easily forget in, in adults. Obviously, the death or loss of a loved one is always going to be an issue. I think for many youngsters, the death of that pet, and sometimes they've only had the pet. The, the bird lasted a week when you got it home from the pet store. How could they be that attached? But it can be very, very difficult for a youngster 
moving away from friends or important people in their world. Yes, we know they can write letters, talk to them on the phone, Skype, and see them again, visit. But for a youngster, that can be very difficult. And then there are other kinds of separations that usually happen in other more difficult, challenging circumstances. So incarceration, foster care, parent being in the hospital, other things that um, can come in the context of, of additional burden and stress for the youngster so that it's not necessarily something we think of as grief because there's no death involved um, or it's not permanent. But I think for a youngster, de particularly depending on the age, that, that can be very powerful. And then I think there are issues that are related to both the physical and psychological loss of former self. So for example, a youngster who's in a significant motor vehicle accident and is, um, has a, a, a paraplegia um, and is in a wheelchair. You know, there's a loss of their former self and of their capacity and of their potential that um, we need to support kids and families in grieving. Um, or even, you know, the youngster who's been doing fine and develops, unfortunately, a major mental illness. There's a, there's a psychological loss of, of who they were or who they could have been that's important for us to think about. And one of the things we know is that after a first break of, of a first psychotic break in schizophrenia, when the patient is, is sort of recovering from that and, and um, getting those symptoms under control, it's, it's quite common actually for there to be a depressive episode with a high risk of suicide because of this loss of their former self and the realization that they have a major mental illness that will never go away. That really can impact, impact young people and, and adults as well. And it's something that we should sort of keep on the list of things that can lead to grief. Next slide. Can you, Emily, that, that's a really, really important point. Mm -hmm. And since you're the one who's right there when major mental illness uh, tends to be diagnosed, Mm -hmm. um, do you, is there something special you say about that or anticipate with people when they've got a new diagnosis yeah, uh, I, of bipolar I, or psychosis or something? Yeah. I, one of the things we talk about is something called role induction, which is the idea of becoming a patient. And, and giving yourself over to the reality, just as if you know a young person gets diagnosed with diabetes, you know, type 1 diabetes, and for the rest of their life they're going to have that. There is something about how to proactively incorporate that component of self into their whole sense of self. So it is not, they are not only a diabetic, but they are a young person with type 1 diabetes. They are not only a schizophrenic. I don't like to refer to patients that way. I don't like to refer to patients as a disease. but um, they are a person who has that. And I think it's an important to have as a proactive part of the conversation and think about what parts of themselves are the same and can preserve, be preserved and what do we need to do to ensure that they get preserved, not just by the patient themselves but by their, their families and the people that they interact with. Because sometimes what happens is, oh, you have schizophrenia. I'm not really available to hang out anymore. Um, and so there can be loss of the... The, the social network that was attached to your former self. I think the, and then the final thing I would say about that is being alert to signs and symptoms of depression um, in, in that post-psychotic period. Um, and, and then, as we'll talk about, like in any other situation, how the important people in your life navigate that is going to be incredibly important. So does I that get at what you were asking? That, that was great. I think that HIV is another situation like that, and hopefully we're not seeing that too much in, in the uh, pediatric absolutely. population. But even absolutely. when there's no symptoms whatsoever, getting that diagnosis just changes your whole sense of yourself and what your future holds. And I think similarly that has a ripple effect on how you view your social networks, your role and responsibility in your social networks, and how your social networks view you in turn. And, and I think that is um, humiliation and rejection um, for many people. But, but I would say sort of when there's any kind of mood symptoms, and particularly in adolescence, we know that suicide risk goes up when there's an acute humiliation or rejection. And so whether it's in the, we talked about uh, maybe two months ago about LGBT youth, um, yeah. that family rejection is a huge risk factor and red flag for, for risk. Um, but, but I think in, in any kind of these situations as well. Okay, so 
as parents, and I don't know, some of the people on the call are probably parents, may have been in these situations, but I think we see parents who want to protect their youngsters. Like 99.99% of parents want good things only for their kids. There are some true malignant people out there, but thankfully they're relatively rare. But we do all kinds of funny dances to try to avoid talking about these things. So, you know, it, it's on, um, I think it's in the Peanuts comic strip where they talk about the puppy farm, you know. Um, you know, the, oh, the dog didn't die, we just took them someplace else where they're going to live a long and happy life, or we don't want to discuss it because we don't want to upset the youngster, um, or we just say, well, you know, Grandma was very old and, you know, she lived a full life, so it's okay that she died. Um, and I think, you know, we all do those things, and it's not that it's, it's a, a crime to do it. I think it's more about being aware of what some of those messages can lead to. Um, and kids can hear those messages as that, oh, better not talk about it, um, or get the wrong idea and have misinformation. Um, and it's also, I think, a missed opportunity. And this is the one that I probably talk about the most with families who are struggling with this. But part of growing up is learning how to be in your world with your people. And how we grieve and the rituals we use, the words we use, what we do, is anxiety binding and um, belonging defining? That's not really English, but um, it, it helps us feel part of a community, small or large. And I think that that's a really important thing that parents are doing all the time. We model how to read. We model how to, you know, be kind to somebody. But we also need to model how to be sad and how to manage our sad emotions and how to how we in our microculture or whatever do these things um, because there's a, there's learning that happens as well and we'd rather the learning be explicit and intentional rather than a hidden curriculum which can happen and that's part of why using the opportunity of losing a pet and being in, in pediatrics this, we get that opportunity to when people, the child will often come right into the room and say that their pet died. Right. And the parent didn't have that as part of their agenda for the visit at all. But it's a great opportunity to talk about um, how to practice what you'll eventually have to deal with with the death of people. Practice it by honoring the pet properly with a, with a, you know, a, a ritual ceremony of some kind and, and showing real sadness and expressing the sadness words um, all Give a give you a practice run. Absolutely, that's true. That is true. And and then I think the other thing that can happen is that depending on the circumstances, the parent may be dealing with their own grief, um, and they may be more focused on themselves in that moment um, and in that time window, and they may not be as able to be present for the child. And and that's just something that deserves some conversation. Um, and we can talk a little bit later about how to handle that in a more specific way. Okay, next. Okay, so I'm just going to run through this quickly because you guys know all this. Um, but basically, the f zero to two-year-olds have no idea about what death is. They don't understand death. They don't understand time. They don't understand permanence. It makes life very fun. Um, but what they do have is that they respond to the emotions and behaviors of the people they love. They are unbelievably observant. We may think they're not paying any attention, but they pay attention to everything that we do. Um, and, and that's why, actually sometimes as a sidebar, sometimes their behavior is not so pleasant because they're watching what we do. Um, but they are very sensitive typically to changes in routine or schedule or nurturance. Who's there? Who's not there? Is somebody, where did mom go? Why is mom crying all the time? What's going on? Why am I not being put down for a nap? I always have to go down for a nap. What's different today? Um, and I think that's the part of it that parents need to understand, that they're not going to talk about the person who's not there, but they will talk about the people who are there and how they are behaving towards the youngsters. Next. Right, and notice that she said zero to two. There isn't a bottom age where children don't respond to the emotions of others, really. Absolutely. There's some, we, this is something I care a lot about, having trained with Dr. Brazelton, where you can see babies uh, reflecting the emotions on the face of the people around them um, really from a very young age, certainly three months of age, but probably younger than that too, depending on the kids. So 
Um, so these things, these things shake it up. And of course, the people may, may be misinterpreting the child's uh, changes in sleep and eating and activity, and they may be irritable with them because they're already in a state of grief. So it's a real, it can be a kind of a tricky time to navigate, and often a good time to have somebody who is not as affected by the loss be participating as part of the family, somebody who's familiar with the kid and can reassure them and have some fun uh, mm -hmm. while everyone else is struggling. Mm -hmm. and the same thing could be said for parents who are depressed and uh, not from grief. Right. We'll, 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 get, we'll get to that, yeah. Okay, okay. Sorry. sorry. Okay, so two to four-year-olds, um, they do not understand, understand that death is forever. They see it as tr temporary and reversible. So at least they, they can hear the word but they just think it's for now, like everything else is for now. Um, they do, they have established bonds of trust, and so they will become anxious about where did the person go. If the person who has passed is, say, a parent or, or a very close caregiver in some way, because they will not understand why they're not coming back. Um, they also, just like the zero to twos, they will totally respond to the emotion behaviors of the loved ones. One of the things that sometimes can be difficult for parents of kids in this age group is that parent will have explained, you know, um, mommy died, she's been sick, whatever, she passed, with whatever the language is they do it, on Monday. On Tuesday morning, the kid wakes up and says, where's mommy? And so if parents don't understand that they're going to have to explain this multiple times because that's developmentally normal, that can be exhausting for parents or for whoever it is that's, that's managing. Um, and so it's really important that that be explained to the adults so they're prepared for it. Otherwise, it feels just like they're on Groundhog Day. And that's what it is. Living with a two- to four-year-old is always a Groundhog Day kind of experience. Um, <laughs> I would also say that sometimes kids this age show no reaction, or that's what the adults say. They, 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 they don't seem upset. Um, and sometimes that can be because they don't really understand what's going on, and they may not have the best social cueing to figure out what's going on. Sometimes, though, it can be the opposite. These kids can be exquisitely sensitive, and they want really hard for everything to be okay. So it's important that no reaction doesn't mean no reaction. It, it's worth understanding what it is that's going on because there may be behaviors, but there's not necessarily an emotional reaction. Okay, next. Okay, so four to seven-year-olds, and, and you know, this is really sort of pre-K to through first grade, really. They do understand cause and effect, and they do understand forever, although they don't understand time yet. Um, but they also have some other cognitive things that are really important. One is a rather egocentric view of the world, which is I cause everything, and then also with magical thinking or illogical connections. And, you know, it's, you know, Grandma died today because I wore my pink sweater. Um, and so those can be really important um, aspects of their cognitive development that parents understand because parents need to make sure that that's not what kids are thinking. Grandma didn't die because Susie wore her pink sweater. Um, not that they will necessarily believe us when we correct them, but it is important that we do not allow them to own that responsibility um, without saying, you know, that's not what happened and, you know, I think that's a really important developmental piece for parents to wrap their head around um, because a lot of those kids can look really savvy um, and they may keep those egocentric explanations to themselves if parents are being cautious. Um, and so, so that's important that parents understood, understand that they could be um, attributing blame to themselves or to somebody else um, in a way that, that's not going to be constructive. Right, and actually, if this sounds just like a divorce talk, it's mm -hmm. just like a divorce talk. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the key outcomes, one of the key reasons for bad outcome from divorce is if children are allowed to continue to think it's their fault. So it's worth just putting it out there, it's not your fault. Right. And, 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 right. and as many times as necessary. Yeah. Okay, okay next. There we go, there you go. Um, so now we get into the sort of elementary school age kids, um, and 
these kids really are qualitatively different from a cognitive standpoint. I mean, they understand that death is permanent. They understand that it's universal. They understand time. And yet they are also very concrete. So they can often generate bazillions of questions. Well, why did it happen? And when, when, why did that happen? And why did the doctor say that? Or why did she do it that way? Or what happens when they're in the ground? And what happens when they're dead? And what will happen with me? And a million questions. And again, if parents aren't, or, or the adults around them aren't prepared for all those questions, that can be exhausting too. Many of these kids are watching really carefully. And they may begin to, again, depending on their own temperament and their own prior experience, begin to worry about other people. Is so-and-so going to die? I don't want to get in a car because there could be an accident. You know, all kinds of things. And you might see kids suddenly have decreasing concentration. They're not sleeping as well or eating as well. They may be trying to do the opposite, which is to cheer everybody up. You see the kids who be instantly become the, the, the family clown when anybody gets sad because they realize that they can get a response, they can draw the attention and energy, and um, people laugh when they do that. They may begin to sort of take on, you know, idealize the, the person who passed and, like, be totally preoccupied with that person. They may become a parentified child, depending on the circumstances, and be, try to be responsible. You know, well, if mom died, well, now it's my job to take care of all the other children. Um, sometimes these kids get body aches um, that uh, can, can be problematic, um, depending on, again, the circumstances. Sometimes that's just how the kids express distress and need, but sometimes it can be, depending on what the person in their world passed from, it can be something in a similar vein in terms of those symptoms. Next. Okay, so preteens um, really can understand a little bit more details around death, um, and so they have a, a greater capacity to think about the specifics of what happened with a little bit, you know, maybe even emerging abstract capacity. Um, but they're also beginning to feel a tension between their peer group and their family as the priority, and so they may begin to tell their, their peers, um, or they may not want to be different with their peers and so not tell anybody what's going on. Um, their own body changes may begin, may make them more aware of somatic issues. Um, they may be more alert or vigilant to them. Um, they may begin to worry about how the loss will impact their daily living, and for many of our families, it does impact their daily living. And so you can really see a wide range of reactions um, and it, a lot of it will depend on who that youngster was beforehand, what their temperament was, what their coping skills were, um, and how they go forward. Next. And they may, you, you mentioned anger on this slide, uh -huh. anger, irritability, and bullying. And I might just say that, that people can be, that children can be angry at the other children who still have a mom. Absolutely. Who still have a dad. Right. That's right. kind of how that shows up. It's not fair. And, um, yeah. You know, it isn't fair, and they're right, and sometimes kids get stuck on, well, why me? It's not fair. And then what I would say about teenagers and beyond is that anything goes. <laughs> True. Um, they can look like a 0 to 2 year old, a 2 to 4 year old, 4 to 7, 7 to 10, 10 to 12, or they can look like an adult. And, um, and they can flip flop between all of those stages, I would say. Um, just depending on how close the loss was, the timing of the loss for them, the, what happened, and, and the implications for them, and who they were before. Um, because, again, that's what gets exaggerated. Um, it's who we were, what we have, and what we did gets all exaggerated. Next. Okay. So to complicate all of that, there are some things that we need to be thinking about with, with the families, um, one is, is there any pre-existing psychopathology and is it being managed or not? And that's true whether it's an adult or the youngster. So um, I think that, you know, parents who have psychiatric difficulties during time of stress can precipitate out an episode. So if they are well managed and connected to care, that's great. If they are not, that may not be so good. We see parents who start drinking again, parents who have a recurrence of depression, parents who stop taking their medicine and get psychotic again. All of those things which are part of their own grief response, all of them, though, unfortunately, are terrible for children. 
both generally but also in a grief situation. But similarly for youngsters, if that child or teenager has had prior anxiety problems, it's probably going to get worse. If they've had prior depression, they may be at risk for mood problems. If they've had substance use, they're at risk for reusing. So we really do need to understand each person and the family's prior experience around these issues. We have to be mindful of the economic impact and the distractions that they bring to the grieving process. You know, are they going to be evicted? Are uh, you know all those kinds of practical things? Because all of those things, separate from the loss, are also bad for children. They're bad for grown-ups too. But wearing our, our pediatric provider hat, they're bad for children. Um, so we have to be thoughtful about that. Um, the other thing would be, and this is true around anything as well. We need to be mindful of who agrees and who disagrees and where the power is in the family and how they want to navigate it. If mom and dad don't agree about whether Johnny should go to the funeral, we're going to have a problem. Um, if they don't agree about whether to talk about it or not talk about it, we're going to have a problem. And so sometimes it's really important to check in with the adults and see where they are before even thinking about how they're going to handle the youngsters. And then, as we've talked about before, sometimes there are overlapping roles of grief and guilt. So the situations, the, and these are just some of the most awful situations to navigate. They're just heartbreaking. The teen was out driving with the parent and is involved in an accident, and the parent is killed. Or one parent is driving, and the other parent is killed in the event. Those kinds of situations are very complex and require probably industrial strength skills right. at optimizing outcomes, I would say. Um, and mo many of those families will probably benefit from a primary mental health intervention in addition to primary care support. Um, but those are, those are very complex situations that um, are, are just painful in many, many ways. And let, me, let me just mention that, that one of the kinds of intervention that's available is through a religious organization. That mm -hmm. Um, that, that priests and ministers and rabbis um, should all be trained in dealing with situations of grief and loss. And, and they, they, yes, they should be. And, and they uh, can be very helpful. Now, there's a few situations where they are the opposite of helpful if they, um, if they take a too strong a stance that doesn't respect the psychological needs of the person who's remaining. But overall, I think that it's a good recommendation, and that's something to keep in mind for especially since uh, grief and funerals are often associated with whatever your religion says you're going to do, and those structures can be helpful, but the real, the, the trained professional from the religion can be very helpful too. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so just some other general considerations I would say is that because kids are a moving target, the reality is they will rework significant losses at each subsequent developmental stage. So the child, the example I just have here is a kid whose mother dies when she's very young. You know, when, when that girl enters adolescence, missing mom becomes different than missing mom when you're two. And so there are new waves of grief that will happen over the developmental spectrum. And again, helping families anticipate that is a really important part of anticipatory guidance, I would say. So just because they've navigated it and life is back to normal, it hasn't gone away. And I think families need to know that so that they can be alert to what it is that's going on at another stage. Then there's something that some people call puddle jumping, which is how youngsters uh, can handle grief. And this is really just very concrete. But if you watch, you know, like a toddler as they're walking down the street and it's rained and there are puddles um, on the sidewalk, they will run and jump in a puddle, splash around, splash around, splash around, and then they're done. And they keep walking until they come to another puddle. Then they splash around, splash around, splash around, and then they're done. And that is often how people will describe how youngsters grieve because it is different than adults. They'll dive in for a little bit, and then they're done. And it doesn't mean they have finished. It just means they're done for now. Um, and so sometimes a parent will think, oh, good, we've gotten through it, we're over it, and then they jump into another puddle and they're wailing again at, when they go to bed because they're missing whoever or whatever it was. And I think, I think it's just a really, to me, I love the term puddle jumping because I think it really captures that childhood spirit and I think it's a frame that most parents can wrap their head around. 
And then I think similar to, um, you know, Barbara mentioned, you know, post-divorce, but I would say post-loss parenting is really the same as post-divorce parenting, and it's about clarity, consistency, and caring. And um, those are the things that matter the most, um, and some of our families are ready for that, and some of our families have work to do before they can get there. And that's part of our work, too, I would say, as primary folks, primary care folks, that to figure out what are the barriers that families may be facing to get back to parenting with clarity, consistency, and caring. Um, and, I, and I think that the how well a youngster does post-divorce, post-loss, depends primarily on that. Um, next. Okay, so just some other things. So I'll just, these are these some from the literature, some from experience. Um, timing, I would say tell sooner rather than later. The last thing a kid wants to learn is that you've known and have been withholding the information. Um, and I, I think that just adds another layer of burden for that parent-child relationship. And um, so unless there's a very specific reason, um, I, I think it is important to, to know because, again, kids will sense at whatever age, even, you know, a, a two-month-old will sense that there's something going on. They're very attuned to that stress. Um, location. This isn't something to necessarily tell youngster at the bus stop when there are other people around. And you'd be amazed. What our, I mean, probably you guys aren't amazed, but some of our families do wackadoodle things um, because of their own anxiety or stress and, like, I just need to blurt it out. Um, so making sure that the kids are in a familiar and comfortable and quiet place to be able to really hear the, hear the information and to make sure that there's enough time to, to process it in however short or long a time the youngster wants. I think it's important to be simple and specific and not to use euphemisms or, you know, talk around something, but to be clear. But again, parents typically need to practice that and find the words that seem most comfortable for them. And, you know, sometimes in medicine we use an ask, tell, ask um, uh, model where we're working with a patient around a diagnosis or a treatment plan. And, and I think, you know, it could be pause, speak, pause, or, you know, just making sure that there's not too much talking by the adult to give the youngster floor time and, and um, to, to ask their questions, to listen, maybe repeat things and whatever. I think it's also, as mentioned before, really important to share and model our own feelings as appropriate. doesn't mean to get hysterical with, with the youngsters necessarily, but, but I think sometimes our parents don't know that it's okay to cry, um, and, and I think it is. Um, this comes up in a slightly different context. I get... Um, uh, trainees asking me all the time, well, is it okay? Well, I, I felt like I might cry in front of the patient and family. And, I, you know, I think if a, if a story is really moving and touching, that's a human emotion. To me, that's okay. Again, as long as it's not out of proportion or inappropriate for the context. I think there are different ways that parents can show support. Some are verbal, some are physical, some are both. Any way is okay. Um, you know, sometimes there's not much to say, but a hug can go a long way, and, and I think some of our parents need a little permission to not have to say it, but to maybe show it, or, or vice versa. I think it's also important that um, parents understand that, that whatever a child is feeling is okay, which is different than whatever a child is doing is okay. But all feelings are okay to have, even if they don't have any feelings right now. If they're not feeling sad, that's okay too. We never want to make a youngster feel bad because they're not sad that grandma died because they may just not know what to do with that. And then this issue of patience that we need to help our families with because there may be a lot of retelling or re-explaining that goes on. And then this issue of inclusivity as we've talked about before. Next. Okay, so that's all normal. There are though times when we need to worry. Um, and I think, I think of it as a couple of different Let's go with the three P's here. So one is persistence. Like, how long is this lasting? What kind of symptoms is it that are persisting? You know, changes in mood, sleep, appetite, energy, isolation, loss of interest or participation, school failure, peer rejection. How, it's, it's just going on longer than you think it might maybe should. Preoccupation. Sometimes we see kids who get very, very preoccupied with the person that they've lost. They want to join them. So they see them. They hear them talking to them. And particularly important about that is if it's not consonant with family or cultural bounds. Um, and that doesn't mean they're hallucinating. It just means there's a degree of distress that needs to be understood better. 
We also see kids who get pro uh, somatically preoccupied with death, dying, illness, whether it's hypochondriacal or, or just like they spend all their time on, on you know, Google searching up, you know, up to date and, and looking stuff up. Um, and then when it precipitates out a prior problem. So a prior episode of depression, prior anxiety problem, prior substance use, those are really the things that I worry about the most. Um, because I think I think that can be very problematic. Um, is there is there a next slide? Yeah, let me just uh, just mention that uh, it's normal in adults also to think you saw somebody who was a deceased person, and that can go on for a long time and be normal. Mm -hmm. um, and and also um, that that a child who adamantly wants to die in order to join a relative actually is a possible suicidal risk, depending on their age. So you really have to take it seriously. And when the family has conveyed some thought that you'll get to go there when you die and you'll see your mom again, and they're very clear as though that were totally real, the children may want to go. And so right. you have to be careful. Absolutely. Right. Next. Okay. So, so you say you have some worries. Okay, now what do you do? Um, and I think the biggest issue is to really understand how the family is handling the grief. What kind of parental stability or instability or psychopathology is there? Have you known about? Is anybody else in the family concerned about what you're noticing? Or have they brought the concerns to you? It's a lot easier if they bring it to you. If you notice it and nobody else seems worried, that can be hard. We have to look for impairment either in family, school, or social interactions. And we have to wonder if normal grief is morphing into an anxiety disorder, a mood disorder, a psychotic illness, or substance use. Um, and again, basically by rule of thumb, prepubertal kids don't have psychotic illness. Um, it can happen, but it's very, very unusual. So just because, as Barbara was saying, just because they say they see somebody, that does not mean they have hallucinations. Anxious kids will report that. And Depressed kids can report it as well, and so um, just being mindful, and also then, of course, substances can make somebody hallucinate too. But I think I think it's really understanding the context for this family and where this kid fits in the family, um, and then again, what they had before, and is that reoccurring? And then, okay, so. I think, you know, for families, you guys are their biggest resource. Um, and I think it's really important to help clarify for them what is normal and when should you be worried. I think that's one of the biggest roles that you all play in, in this area. Um, there are a lot of grief groups nationally, locally. They can be online, face-to-face. -face. They can be for a kid, a family, a parent, any combination you can think of. And they can be for any kind of grief. Um, it's, it's really quite remarkable. Sometimes a school counselor can be a big help. Sometimes, um, you know, some of the schools that have a lot of military youngsters whose parents may be deployed, um, you know, schools near bases and things like that, these school counselors are very familiar because sadly kids in their school lose a parent to war. And so... Um, those, those folks can be very skillful, and often there are grief groups for those kids or groups where only one parent is home and because the other is deployed. Mm -hmm. And then, as was talked about earlier, the religious community and clergy can be a huge resource both in um, normalizing and supporting the normal reaction, but also in clarifying that this is not how we do this in our religious community. <laughs> this is something different. That can be very helpful sometimes as a collaborative uh, you know, a collateral source of information if you're trying to tease out, is this how they do it in this group or does this seem funky? Um, and that the religious leaders can be quite helpful with that. Um, many years ago, I, I did my adult psychiatry training in Washington Heights in New York at Columbia. And um, at the time, and I think probably still, it was a very, um, the community had a very large proportion of um, immigrants from the Dominican Republic, who, many of whom um, uh, followed uh, Santeria which is um, really an intersection of, of Catholicism and um, Caribbean beliefs. And there were um, uh, healers in that community. And um, one of the things I had the opportunity to do was to meet with one of the, the senior healers in the community. And she was very clear with me, she, with, with the group of us that she was meeting with. We were all psychiatrists. She said, look, 
I deal with, and these were essentially her words, I deal with neuroses, you deal with psychoses. Um, and so even within the cultural beliefs, the, the senior healers will know what is illness. Something is different here. And that can be a really helpful ally to have as part of, of the work that you're doing. I think and, and if I could just add something about religion there, is to say that um, you don't have to under, you, we as pediatricians don't have to understand every religion and cultural group. Oh, All we have to do no. is be willing to ask. We right. can just say, how would that be handled in your family or in your culture? Right. What do you say to the child about where the dead people go and right. get their perception on things? Right. Um, and then just a couple of thoughts, and we've sort of touched on these. I think there are some that are harder than others. Um, some diseases that people die from do have more stigma attached to them. They just do. Um, some mechanisms of death have more stigma attached to them. And some um, agency issues in related to agency, uh, as in um, who was the, the cause of the event, come, brings with it different shame and distress. Um, and I think we need to be alert to that because all of the people involved there um, probably have a higher risk of difficulty navigating the, the normal grief paths in, in, in any of these and, and probably some others that I haven't listed as well. Um, uh, and, and so I think they can all be relevant. You know, thinking about when a parent suicides, the impact that has on the youngster, the shame that can have in the community, um, all kinds of things, the model that it sets for what's an option, all kinds of things get so much more complicated that require a different level of in intervention above and beyond the, the, the normal things that, that we all would, norm would, would think to do. Do you, do you want to say something about, let's say you've got a kid who's over 13 or, or who's 12 or older and mature enough, do you recommend telling them that the, that the death was a suicide? So I, I have my opinion, but I'd like to hear yours. Yeah, you know, I think... I, I don't know that I would say a universal answer. I think this is where it, it um, my bias would be to, to the yes, but I think there are some caveats. I think it depends on how that young person's mental health is. Um, I think if I'm worried about their fragility and their own suicide risk, I might wait on that. But I, I don't think that things should be hidden because they always come out. Um, and I think that's worse than, in the, than hearing about it at the front end. So I think it really has more to do with how, when you are going to tell, how are you going to do that? How are you going to ensure that there's a, 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 you know, a safety net for that teenager to handle that information? Who's going to tell? Who's going to be there? How are you going to have that conversation? What day of the week? What, what, what are the other things that are going on for that kid? So to me, it's a really planned and planful activity um, so that whatever comes next, people are prepared for, and that needs to be anticipated. Um, but I think it's a terrible thing for a young person to find out weeks, months, years later that that was withheld from them. And I think it, it does that for, I, the, what worries me about that is a number of things. One is it communicates we didn't trust you enough to tell you, we didn't love you enough to tell you, we didn't think it mattered, all kinds of messages in that way. But also, young people need to know that they're at greater risk for suicide if they have a first degree relative who committed suicide. That's part of owning one's own health history. And I think that that's important as well. Um, it's different if, if, if you don't have that in your history, you're at different risk for things. And just as we would want people to understand their risk for, you know, the BRCA gene, right? People need to understand that psychiatric illness has a genetic vulnerability as well. Um, so, so my answer is a yes with a few dots after it, I would say. But you're saying that basically it all depends on the child and the state of mind that they're in. It does, and I think who the adults are that would be telling and what their agenda might be in telling. Sometimes what can happen, unfortunately, is that mom suicides, dad's parents tell mom, 
tell the child that mom did this because she would see how terrible she was, <laughs> you know. So right. sometimes the telling is done for somebody's agenda, and that's all part of that preparation. Like, who's going to tell? Why are they telling? What's the message? And I think embedded in the telling can be the opportunity to increase the taboo on that because it's a very hostile act to do. It's an act of desperation, but it's also it, it, it's hostile in many ways. And so I think it's important for the tellers and the tellee to be prepared to handle it. <laughs> 